Okay, uh, welcome to our panel on cities of the future. Um, we have uh, the four of us panelists here. I'm Brett Cousins. Uh, I'm in Calgary. Uh, I'm a historical uh, fiction writer. <laughs> uh, we have Ariel Kroon, uh, Holly Schofield, and Ron Friedman as the panelists on this. Uh, we will go around and have people introduce themselves and and what kind of writing they do. We'll start with Ariel since she's on my right or maybe left. Thank you very much, Brett. <laughs> okay, so immediate disclaimer, I'm not actually a writer. I'm sorry, I'm a fraud, mm -hmm. but I, I am a scholar. I am a PhD student in English at the University of Alberta. And so I study science fiction, uh, technically post-apocalyptic science fiction, and I have a very keen interest in solar punk, which is all about the cities of the future. And so I'm very excited to talk to everybody on this panel and get some really cool ideas going. Okay, uh, move over to Ron. Oh, Holly's over there. That's a full area. That's really oh, good. Ron. Uh, Ariel, well, very good to have you here. Uh, maybe you can critique some of our books. Uh, I'm a science fiction writer. Uh, I publish 18 short stories in different magazines and anthologies and a novel. Uh, most of my story and the novel I'm working on now takes place in the near future. Some of the stories are here on Earth and some uh, in space. And these stories feature cities. I mean, they have cities and as a science fiction writers, our role is trying to predict the future based on what we know and uh, other than that, I'm a blogger with um, on Quera with 2.7 million views. I write about different stuff, mostly about space, um, and I look forward to this panel. Back to you. Thank you. Uh, Holly. Hi, I'm Holly Schofield. I'm a science fiction writer. I started writing about seven years ago. I have about 80 stories published of hard and crunchy science fiction for the most part. Uh, in places like Analog and Escape Pod. And I often write about cities of the future, uh, including being in, in the anthology City of the Future. Um, I try to write uh, optimistic science fiction, even if it's post-apocalyptic, which uh, is pretty hard to do, uh, especially these days, right? But I think people do need to, to have that shred of hope these days and have the story end on a positive note as much as it can be. Uh, and I also um, try to imagine different types of cities. So Ariel be, might be pleased to know I write a lot of solar punk and I've had stories in solar punk winters and solar punk summers, uh, writing about intentional communities, uh, smaller communities, perhaps things that are different than the typical large uh, city. So um, it's a really fun hobby that's become an obsession. Thank you. Okay, so the first question to the panelists will be, uh, what, how, do, how, how would you describe what cities are going to be like in the future? And I'd like to start with our PhD experts and she's studying it. We'll, we'll get the uh, definitive definition first and go from there. <laughs> All right, well, I don't know that I can give you the definitive definition since technically I'm sort of studying adjacent to that is the, the post-apocalyptic ruined part, which I don't think we really want to infect our ideas of what the cities of the future should be like. <laughs> but when I do study solar punk, um, I actually see a lot of the seeds of the cities of the future in what cities are doing right now. Um, so, for example, I live in the city of Edmonton, and the city of Edmonton right now has a city climate resilient uh, adaptation strategy and action plan that they've been sort of quietly working on since um, 2016, or it was proposed in 2016 and then approved by the council in 2018. But it includes like sort of like almost littler things like 
uh, homeowner rebates for solar installations and flood prevention home checkups and sort of low impact development landscaping for new developments and stuff like that. So it's very incremental in creating a livable city of the future. The most big shiny example, I think, in Edmonton is how the Edmonton Convention Center recently is, uh, it got an upgrade so that its entire surface roof, I guess, is covered with solar panels. So it's completely solar, uh, self-sustainable that way. And that's the sort of flashy part of it. But a lot of what these climate resilience strategy is, is implementing things that we're not going to really see until I think maybe in like 10, 20 years when it gains sort of a critical mass and all of a sudden, all of these homes now have uh, solar panels on top of them and it is very noticeable to see. And so right now, sort of the cities of the future I see as kind of um, almost, well, an urban initiative of, of the city council, but also an individual initiative or a neighborhood collective initiative. And so it's sort of starting very small and grassroots and working upwards. And so I can see cities of the future still having quite a bit of older architecture that maybe is more retrofitted to deal with the hazards of the future in terms of climate. So. Okay. Uh, we'll keep in the order. I'll go to Ron next. Okay, so the way I see it, there are three uh, main factors that could uh, de determine how cities in the future are going to look like. Uh, one is a population trend. Uh, we're going to have fewer people, more people, population explosion, deplosion. Uh, another thing is technology level, uh, especially as a science fiction writer. Uh, technology can solve a lot of things. For example, we can create clean energy, we have problem with waste, problem with CO2, uh, food, I mean, food, food, and, uh, food and waste disposal. It's the, the biggest things about how future cities are going to look like. And last thing was already touched by other panelists here is climate. So speaking of climate, I wrote a short story that takes place maybe 20 years in the future that in Vancouver. And it's not, not the main plot, but they are facing some problem in uh, properties that are right next to the sea because of uh, rising sea levels. So they, they build, uh, they have technology, so they build some kind of a transparent wall to protect these properties. I could imagine that some peace cities may have to be evacuated. I don't know, that could be issue in Miami or New Orleans, places like that. Um, yeah, so that's three elements. Uh, population, technology, climate, and we can divide it. We can have two types of future, uh, utopian or dystopian. A lot of it depends on us. Like Mad Max scenario or Star Trek scenario. Yeah, okay. Um, move over to Holly. Uh, I don't see science fiction necessarily as predictive. Uh, I see it more as uh, something that could inspire people to explore different things that may happen. So a lot of the climate fiction um, and the cities of the fiction that's out there does have major flaws and it is unworkable, but it may leave the reader walking away with a different way to think about their own city. Um, an example might be um, several recent books mentioned food forests um, where you can walk down the street and uh, rather than there's an ornamental shrub there, there's a blueberry bush and you can pick some blueberries as you're walking down the street. So just incorporating food sustainability into a city, uh, which of course may or may not be workable. There's exhaust fumes, there's pesticides. It's, it's a tricky thing to do. Uh, but writing it as a, either a strict utopia or strict dystopia doesn't really do service, I don't think, to what a city can be, uh, as Ariel pointed out, it's going to have old buildings, new buildings, medium age buildings, uh, a whole mixture of systems uh, layered upon layer. Um, part of Vancouver uses the very old steam network downtown that's 100 years old uh, and it still functions and it's actually um, pretty uh, um, conservative use of energy, it's not bad. Um, so, uh, 
the way I see that a science fiction writer can help uh, stimulate thought is just to sort of exaggerate things and use hyperbole even in some cases or take it off off world like uh, writing about generation starships and how they would work because they're an enclosed community just as the earth is uh, really yeah. uh, one big ecosystem uh, if you think about it so I think there's a lot of places to go but they're not necessarily predictive I think yeah, that's a, a really good point that you make there, Holly, with the idea that it's one big ecosystem and we're all kind of in this together. Because a lot of what I see um, with creating the policies that will create the cities of the future is when people really recognize that we're in this together and we need to make a change. Usually it's after some sort of catastrophic thing has happened that that um, happens to make a change in the way that people think about the place that they live and the ways that their um, their cities either serve them or hinder what they want to do. And so like you mentioned with the food forest, if there is a drought and there's um, some sort of food shortage, then having the food forest would really drive home to people how sustainable and resilient this city is and there and it becomes sort of a, more of a community whereas um with uh like a flood that happens um like the the calgary flood for example um there's this idea now that we really need to seriously take seriously the sort of like flood proofing of basements and the flood proofing of entire neighborhoods because of how we need to deal with this threat to not just our things and our stuff but it goes and affects all of our neighbors and our entire neighborhood and entire city ward and mm -hmm. so Ron said, you know, like there's, there's a lot of really excellent technology out there right now. Um, and it, I think a lot of it is the, the will to enact and to take a risk and a chance on making that technology a part of city planning is what is needed to truly bring about the cities of the future. Uh, because I think there's a lot of really cool, innovative technologies um, that are real and and in science fiction as well. But there's um, also, we need that sort of like, like political will or social will to kind of enact that. Yeah, I think that comes down to one of the key points I wanna make is leadership. Mm -hmm. If you go through uh, the history of cities, uh, you know, people, who were leaders in a city usually were the merchants who designed the city around their needs and yes. a bunch of poor people and that kind of gathered around. But there was this move to the urban because there was no work in the rural areas. The farmers, uh, there were farmers, but then other, as the population grew, they migrated to the cities. So you can see that all through history. And uh, it's a leadership the right leadership that moved your cities forward. Um, in the case of New York, everybody was coming to New York. Everybody was coming to New York. How did they solve the problem? They built up. Suddenly mm -hmm. they, they started building skyscrapers and taller and taller buildings so they get more people per square yard or square mile or whatever. And you can see that's still happening now. Um, after World War II, everybody could have their own house. So now we've had this suburban sprawl and the right leaders are finding that we're going to need that farmland if we're going to feed all these people. And so um, we're on another push now. They let the inner cities decay because the leadership was corrupt or whatever the case may be. And there's this whole revitalization that started taking place in the 90s, Todd taking down derelict buildings and building new taller buildings, but they seem to be going up again. Uh, buildings are, are going higher and higher up. And yeah, it's, it comes down to leadership. And each city is going to be different. You've got the North American cities who are all kind of, uh, well, it's still corruption going on, but they kind of focused on making the city better 
and uh, deal with, to do uh, doing some deals with the uh, older and maybe the the poor neighborhoods. Try to bring them along, and then you go into the states where there's maybe not so much going on uh, outside the uh, corporate shell, and then you go over to um, Europe. They're they're really pushing on the uh, on the carb, carbon capture and beautifying their city, but they want to keep it old because that's what they've had for centuries and they're beautiful going over there. But they're going to actually, that, that, that's another thing with the population. But before I get there, when you go to the third world, um, you look at those cities and they're just sprawling and there just isn't the leadership to bring it together. And kind of a mix there, if you've ever been to Mexico City, it's like huge. But it's looks like it's still 1942 there. Uh, you know, they don't have street sweepers. The buildings come right up to the sidewalks. They got the cages in front of them. There's, there's not a lot of mod You do get the odd modern building, but there isn't a leadership to really move the city forward. Now, in the case of population, um, it, it's kind. Of, I think it's a it's a well known theory that as societies become more affluent, affluent, affluent <laughs> they have less kids, and so this is why U.S., Canada, Germany, England, France, the populations are all starting to reverse. Uh, the only way to keep the population growing is through immigration. Uh, economies grow only if your population grows. If your population stagnates, your economy does. Japan is a perfect example of that. And there's a country that doesn't have a lot of land, a lot of people. Pretty well everything is, you know, 40 stories or higher there. So, you know, I always took a look at this uh, uh, future cities being dystopian as I think the, what was the movie RoboCop where basically corporations took over governing the cities and it was all based on the bottom line for them and the rest of the people were out there just buy stuff and we're not going to supply you with this, 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 or this. And uh, in some places I could see that happening due to corruption. You're looking at some city governments of uh, some of the cities are in the pockets of the corporations, which are still polluting. They just, you know, they're doing it as cheap as they can and sell their stuff as expensive as they can. The right leadership can take you past that to where you get more along what uh, Ariel was talking about in, in Edmonton. And you see beautif beautification projects going on here. But even in dem democracies with good leadership, they still have to focus on, well, once, what's the next election? I got to make sure everybody's happy about with me, blah, blah, blah. And so, uh, yeah, taking care of uh, flood, uh, take, you know, to protect against major floods in Calgary, not a lot got done until downtown was underwater. And then the emphasis was, emphasis was to fix that. So it's even good leadership tends to be a little on the short-sighted side. Yeah, I see that really tied into whether we're going towards a dystopian sort of like city of the future or a utopian city of the future. I, Or, well, maybe not utopian, but just better than dystopian. Um, <laughs> and, and, yeah, and it really, I think, depends on, like, are you going to get that sort of robocop corporations take over everything because of the sort of short-sightedness of, of political figures who are saying that they can, um, you know, like, they're just worried about the next election cycle. And so instead of like with city city planning, cities can be there for hundreds of years, right? As you said, with like Mexico City, you know, like, um, and so are they thinking 10, 20, 50 years in the future? Or are they just thinking, well, I'm going to patch these potholes now, and then people will like me enough to sort of vote me back in. Whereas, you know, if you have those, those, those uh, city sort of officials who have more of a, a future 
lens where they are thinking, well, we're going to, you know, like, like this is going to put us back like a couple, <laughs> like, like a couple thousand or, or uh, maybe not a couple thousand, a couple hundred thousand dollars um, to retrofit all of these buildings to be more like flood sustainable. Um, but then, you know, like in 10, 15 years when floods are more common, does that then pay off, right? So there's this sort of, the cities of the future, I think like Holly said, it, they, they inspire you to kind of look differently at the way that the city around you is, um, is being built right now in the present. I think actually the pandemic uh, is influencing a lot of that uh, short-term thinking that we have been doing and hopefully leading people to more long-term thinking uh, and hopefully getting uh, past the um, BJ what, what you touched on about uh, that uh, an economy requires growth. Uh, there must be some sort of post-capitalism that we have yet to discover that will uh, allow for sustainability and not continual growth. Um, I'm thinking of Carrie Vaughn's book called Bannerless, uh, which deals with uh, overpopulation and how you need a license in order to have a baby. And uh, that sounds draconian, but it comes across in the book, which is actually a police procedural, uh, it comes across as quite reasonable and everybody just goes with it. And it's sort of a different way of thinking. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong, it's just something that uh, um, can help people think about how we can do better than we've been doing. Uh, so possibly a silver lining to the pandemic, uh, among other things. <laughs> well, in terms of the population, we could raise most of the planet out of poverty, population is going to level off. And then that problem is technically solved. <laughs> I think uh, if I look is at that the... going to happen though? That's the leadership thing. If you look at the uh, UN statistics, uh, the, the way it looks like right now, the fertility rate globally in the Western world or in Japan, it's a lot less, uh, even in Ukraine, in particular. but globally right now it's 2.5 births per woman. And the UN expected it by 2100. It's uh, less, uh, maybe 80 years in the future. Uh, fertility rate will drop to 1.9. This is a uh, below replacement level. Uh, that's mean uh, we may experience actually population collapse similar to Japan rather than population explosion. Uh, another trend that is, that is very much too difficult to predict is technology. So a lot of the things that right now are, are a big issue may not be a big issue in, in the future. Uh, one topic that I spoke about earlier is the waste disposal, plastic is a big issue, not only CO2. CO2 is one issue that could be resolved with solar panel or fusion power, but plastic, look at this device. It's replacing telephone, walkie-talkie, alarm clock, watch. Uh, instead of like five different devices, I now have only one. So I'm generating less, less waste and triple that by 7 billion people who generate less waste by a factor of five. Uh, add to that renewable energy and maybe some of the problem will be resolved just thanks to technology. I'm talking about the optimistic. I write about uh, pessimistic. What I write is a uh, post-apocalypse, but uh, actually well, that's I'm, the, I'm... That's the interesting story, you know. But I'm a, that's are interesting, interested yeah. in optimistic things. <laughs> but a lot of the problem we face now may resolve uh, to some way by future technology. I can talk about that later, but I'll let somebody else yeah. talk for now. Well, yeah, I think the technology uh, is going to um, affect a lot of things. For instance, what we're seeing with the pandemic right now of the remote working, that may stay as a permanent thing and therefore we all need a mm -hmm. home office. So therefore the floor, floor plan of a new house might change and so forth. So considerations like that uh, make, make near future fiction very difficult, right? Well, it's also going to affect your inner cities. It's, like Calgary is a good, a good uh, microism, microism of uh, what happens when population starts disappearing. You're looking at an awful lot of office space downtown that's empty. And yeah, as population period. levels off and starts going the other way, like Ron said, 
what are these cities going to do? There won't be a tax base. Uh, so maybe a post-capitalism uh, system is going to have to come into play sooner or later because economies are going to just stagnate under the current system. Who's going to have the, you know, the, the hope to go out there and say, this is how we got to do things now when there's a bunch of corporations still trying to make money? I think, we have a very good, I think we have a very good example of what happens when, um, when we put the idea of, of economic growth over the, um, and we value it more than, than human life. And that's, that's the example of the United States and what's happening there right now. Um, and so the cities of the future, I think, are going to have to have some sort of mindset shift where they do um, think about, you know, like the people in their cities uh, less than, you know, like the city's overall economy. And so the, um, I mean, one of the, one of the principles of solar punk is, is equity and, and justice for, for everybody who lives within that future city. And this idea that, that treating people as they deserve to be treated will, will eventually, um, you'll be able to, to recoup the costs to the economy that um, are being spent in these social programs because these people will then be able to um, contribute to their society in a more handy and, and able way, right? And so there's that sort of, you have to almost think kind of uh, like flipped that way. And um, Ron, as you were talking, I was thinking of that quote by William Gibson, the future is here, but is it, it is unevenly distributed. So there are some places that are super futuristic. If, if you look at some European cities, um, they have implemented technology like in Paris, like there's free water fountains throughout the city and some of them dispense sparkling water. I want that in my city of the future. Where is that? Um, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, but like it's, you know, the technology is there and the future is there. It's just, it just hasn't made its way over here yet, right? So there's this idea that, you know, we, we are able to do these things, but just it's not, it's not the entire world is able to do it. And so we can see some cities are more in the future than, than others at this point. And another example of that would be, go ahead, Michelle. Another example of that would be uh, incorporating uh, park parks and parkland into the city. Um, mm -hmm. Several European cities, especially in Germany, the parks are part of the city, uh, huge parks. I'm talking like, like we think of um, Banff or something would be part of, a, part of Calgary, uh, zoning wise, uh, so that the children are educated in the forest. The concept of having kindergarten in the forest and that sort of thing, or having uh, walking outside your door and going cross-country skiing, um, making making a, a wider extension of the city to incorporate more than just streets and buildings. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have another question. So. <laughs> okay, so we can talk about it. We talk about uh, capitalism. Yeah, <laughs> I think <laughs> capitalism right, right, right now it's a right now it's a problem to to get rid of because. It, 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 I, I can argue it's evil, but, but it's working. Um, future we may want to aim is uh, something like a post scarcity. If we have a lot of artificial intelligence and automation and ro robotics that could do a lot of the work that uh, we do today. And if you combine them with something that uh, currently we don't know exactly what, but uh, maybe universal basic income, you can maybe eventually get to something like a Star Trek society that is not based on capitalism. And yeah, yeah, Ron, as you were talking, I was thinking, oh, that's Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think universal basic income is, is going to come uh, simply because under capitalism, it actually makes sense. It's cheaper to house a homeless person in, for instance, an empty shopping mall, since the malls are probably going bankrupt too, uh, than it is to do the social programs, as Ariel was saying. So under capitalism, it makes sense to have universal basic income. And of course, from sheer morality or post-capitalism or whatever you want to call it, it also uh, seems to be the thing to do. So I think that is that is coming up. But again, I'm not being predictive about it. Well, you look at the capitalism, we're all talking about post-capitalism society. 
at the end of the day, I think capitalism will do it to itself. They're going to go more, we already see it going into automation, using robots uh, to build cars now. So there's less and less and less employment. And they're going to get caught with the fact that there's no one around now with any money to buy what they're making. So they're basically going to spiral them all themselves into non-existence. And another system will have to come into place. Universal, uh, uh, universal. Basic income. Basic income. That's the thing. For a second. Universal basic income is the next step in keeping society from totally collapsing uh, as capitalism spirals down into non-existence. And yeah. then eventually you'll just say everything's free because, hey, there's a robot making it. <laughs> the, the other way that we're seeing that happen is um, we're seeing that happen in uh, Europe as well, where they recently passed, uh, I'm trying to think of the terminology for it, but it's where you must manufacture things that have replaceable parts that the consumer can take it apart and get spare parts and so on to get, to get around the planned obsolescence that we're seeing uh, in our consumers. It's called the Right to Repair, Holly. That's right. The Right to Repair Act uh, has gone through, I believe, in the, the EU, and hopefully it's coming here, and that would go to a long way towards uh, the type of thing you were just talking about, BG. We have to rebuild, uh, remake how they make cars in North America. <laughs> right now, you can't even find half the parts you need to replace. They're sticking most of them, more and more of them underneath. Like, I remember my alternator used to be right up on top of the engine. Need to replace the alternator, doop, 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 put a new one in. Now it's down under the car somewhere. I can't even find it. So we have a question in the chat there. Uh, I'm curious who would pay for that. So I'm guessing that means who would pay for the universal income. Uh, that's yet to be determined, of course, but it's been shown in Europe that higher taxes uh, still lead to a, a really good lifestyle for the the middle income people and they don't really mind the higher taxes because they're getting so many social benefits out of it. So that would be one way to go, uh, but I'm sure there is others. And as Ron touched on, uh, cheaper technology, more efficient technology, uh, running, let's say city services through more technology would also uh, free up some, some city budget perhaps as well. Yeah. Also, if under universal basic income that is replacing the sh social programs like food stamps and like, um, you know, housing for the homeless, that sort of thing, um, then all of the money that is currently being funneled into those programs would be freed up to go into a pool that the universal basic income would be paid out of as well. And so it's it's not... Like the universal basic income would then just come in and, and replace all of that. And also, I am told, free up a whole bunch of administrative red tape. Um, I, I don't work for the government, but I hear that that is a problem with a lot of those programs. So, um, whereas with the universal basic income, it would just be like one flat thing. And they would not have to pay all of those um, people to sort of administrate the program. They'd have probably... It would be more of a, a central authority like the CRA, uh, the Canadian Revenue, Revenue Agency, that sort of administers that kind of like administer the, you know, the child, child benefit and um, like the, the Ontario trillion, trillion benefit and that sort of thing. So. Yeah. yeah, and also if I might touch, uh, talk a little bit about American politics, though, one of the former candidates for the Democratic Party was Andrew Young. He proposed mm -hmm. to increase the VAT or similar to PST, uh, GST here in Canada. And the idea is that all the big company that makes lots of money like Amazon or all the companies that do automation, they are selling products. So what the government will give money to people and people who will choose to buy products, uh, some of the money will go to pay for these uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a way to indirectly tax the company that sell lots of cheap products. I mean, that's the dream, right, is having the ability to tax these companies that are, you know, like, like putting very high prices for their materials and also making quite a bit of money and being able to redistribute that to the people who um, live in the actual country that um, and are making use of those products as well. So, again, that that's probably another avenue, I guess, of revenue that... Um, 
people are talking about. That's um, Andrew Yang, I think it is. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, you just have to get past the state factor. Uh, you got corporations like it's been the gap has been spreading higher and higher. The mm. rich so much more richer, and it's a greed factor. Um, you look in Europe, and the corporations don't mind paying taxes because their mentality is a happy worker is going to not break things. <laughs> They're going to go on strike. Uh, so they, you don't, you don't see corporations. You see corporations with big numbers on revenue there, but they, they are more than happy to shave their uh, profit margins down and put the tax back in the government to make their country better, where that doesn't seem to be the case in the U.S. They need to change their mentality, and then there'll be lots of money for universal uh, universal programs. Yeah, well, and the same in Canada. I think the idea of corporate taxes, you know, we, we have a bit more of an American mentality than a European mentality at this point. It's kind um, of in the middle. Bad. So, yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, I guess it varies from company to company, but the sort of end point is, is that corporate taxes are, are not really something that people like talking about here. So, um, but it is, you know, it is proven in Europe to be, you know, like a, a duty of the citizen and the corporations are made up of citizens, right? And so they give back to the city that they are part of. And so that city is then able to have the funds to step into the future as opposed to sort of like being held back until there is a, an exceptional event like COVID, for example. Um, and everything just kind of gets rerouted to dealing with that one exceptional event. Um, and so having something more sustainable in place, I think, is also going to be a uh, uh, something of the cities of the future uh, a feature of it is going to be that there will be people responsible for thinking about major catastrophic events and being able to sort of like um, deal with those in a more timely fashion. Do we want to talk about energy? Yes. Talk about energy, yeah. So I, will, I can start with that. Uh, I'm involved in a project to introduce hydrogen energy into the mining industry. Cool. Uh, because they do a lot of electric and they burn a lot of coal to generate that electric. <laughs> but by moving the hydrogen, there, there's an extra, there's an extra uh, bonus that most people don't realize that when you use hydrogen fuel, you make clean water. One of the problems in mining is they, they is the water supply. They have to keep recycling the water and it gets goopier and goopier and starts screwing up with their process downstream. Well, now they have a supply of clean water. So don't just let the steam run off when you burn it in a fuel cell. Uh, collect it and use it in your process. And now your process is a lot more stable. So there's a oh, lot cool. of pluses to hydrogen fuel, which you can do with uh, one of the main ways of making hydrogen, however, is to use natural gas and you end up making CO and CO2. Well, at least you're making it in one location, you maybe can do something with it. Um, I did a project when I was attempting a PhD way, way back. Um, we were microwaving uh, meth methane, see, uh, natural gas basically, and stripping two hydrogens off it to make ethylene and it would make ethylene. And it had to be done at very low pressures. And I'm thinking, I was, I was just thinking the other day, whatever happened to the hydrogen you just stripped off? Well, they made H2, they made hydrogen, which we couldn't collect because it was too light to freeze with nit liquid nitrogen. Um, so that's something in the future that you could bring a, a very uh, low energy intensive technology like microwaves and a generating of fuel, which you can then transport. Yeah, if I, if I may interfere for a okay. second. If I may interfere for a second, we've got the 10 minutes warning, and we may oh. want to open this for the question from the audience. Yeah. We, got a, we have a question from the audience. I don't see anything in capitals. Okay, so about energy, 
I, I think that the most abundant energy source in the solar system right now is the sun. Uh, yes. It's, and I think the amount of energy, oh, sorry, the amount of power that uh, arrive every day to Earth is about nearly 6,000 times more than all the energies of use of humanity. The problem is it's not consistent. It's not coming at night. And it's also not very easy to, to distribute it over long distances. So we either need some kind of very, very good way to store it and some kind of very, very good way to transfer it. Uh, so this is one very good source of energy. Another one that I encounter in uh, research for some of my science fiction books is that uh, like a fusion power. Up until today, everybody say fusion power is always 20 years in the future. But the, in, in recent years, actually, there have been some development, some companies even uh, here in Canada in Burnaby that are making real progress. So it, it, it's not economical right now, but the the border, when it become economical, is getting closer and closer and closer. Right? The, those reactors are getting more and more efficient. And we are not very far away, perhaps even less than one decade right now, from having a commercially viable fusion power, which is cleaner than nu uh, fission nuclear power. And that one in combination with solar panel and maybe some other sources of energy could provide humanity with, with whatever energy we need. Now, if you, if you even look at just solar panels from 30 years ago when they first came out to what they're like now, the conversion rate of sunlight to electricity is like five or six fold what they used to be. And they're continually improving. And as Rob was saying, you're looking at fusion energy, technology continues to roll forward. And, and once we get to a post-capitalist system, it won't be uh, shoved aside because it's cheaper to do something else. Yeah, I can see maybe some, it's gonna depend on where you're located in the world, but some cities probably relying more on solar power um, and like especially cities around the equator where the sun uh, is very strong and some relying on fusion energy, some maybe relying, um, like for example, there's um, the case of Iceland, I think they get 97% of their energy from um, geothermal. Yeah, because they're, I mean, they're basically on top of an active volcanic region, right? So like, it's you know, very easy for them. So it's gonna depend a lot on your geology. Um, so the city, the way that the city of the future sort of takes its energy is going to depend very much on on where they are. Um, and so, like you were saying, there's a, a problem with sort of the transport of solar energy. It might not be feasible to power an entire country with solar energy, but uh, one or two cities here and there um, are going to be sort of more solar energy and others will be reliant more on wind power. And so each city is going to have its own kind of like maybe a, a power curfew or something like that as the technology of, in batteries tries to sort of catch up. If you've got a city by the sea, maybe it's, it's being generated um, or it's being sustained by tidal power. And so th there's all these sort of interesting, I, I think the cities of the future will be a lot less homogenous in terms of energy use. Um, and so being able to sort of explore that, especially within science fiction and um, I guess, as we go forward into the future, it will be really interesting to sort of see the differences in the different systems that each city maximizes on. And I think we also uh, may be getting away from the concept of we want limitless energy, endless energy. There's no such thing as too much energy. Let's look at ways to reduce the energy use and then it doesn't become so critical. If, if cities were raising their own food, then transportation costs between cities would drop as a simplistic example, uh, you know, and if we're no longer taking fancy vacations in airplanes, then, you know, the carbon footprint gets reduced again and so forth. So the, the non-homogenous concept would even be more exaggerated because of that, uh, with less travel happening, perhaps. Um, one of the climate change experts uh, whose name doesn't come to me right now said that the best way that we can all uh, reduce our carbon footprint is just to stay home. So That's make it uh, into <laughs> our castles and so forth as we're currently doing uh, these days. 
uh, may be the thing of the future, and uh, that'll affect uh, city design in the future if they're intentionally designed. There'll yes. be a lot more landscaping and, and people being super into renovating their houses. <laughs> Look are, at how many home gardens are, there are right now. Yeah. We, have un, we have under five minutes left. If somebody from the audience wants to unmute and ask a question or a comment. I think only the hostess can unmute them. So if you want to type your question into chat, we can certainly try and answer it. I believe we didn't set that up. Uh, nope, they can unmute themselves. Yeah. When we do a panel, we don't block everybody out. We do a presentation, we do. Because then it's easy to keep the uh, bombers out. Well, well, let's take a look. Great panel. Everyone, thank you for this great panel. Somebody uh, just saw solar energy about one kilowatt per square mile. Um, it used to be a lot less than that. And there are an example of a place where solar energy is really kicking butt is Australia. Because they got a whole whack of land, like most of their continent, is flat desert. And it just gets baked every day. So they put a lot of solar panels, but there was something sort of a combo solar wind project where they made this glass uh, funnel. And what happens is the sun comes down and heats up the air and then the air rises and the funnel forces it up this tube where they have a whole bunch of little propellers and they were generating electricity from there. So every day the, the sun would come up warm up the air, drive it up through this funnel, and they were generating, I don't remember how much, but it was something like a megawatt. Just so, that, I think the, the number in chat there uh, is uh, one kilowatt hour uh, per square meter. So uh, the average household uses oh, something yeah. like 40 kilowatt hours a day or something. So uh, uh, the average householder's roof currently, if for a Calgary roof, let's say, would not be quite enough to generate their own energy. Something there has to change, whether it's putting uh, solar panels out in the prairie or whatever, I don't know, but just doing it through our current uh, homeowner footprint or apartment building, for instance, is probably yeah. insufficient, um, depending, of course, on what part of the world you're in. Yeah, I heard they're building a 500, I think, megawatt uh, solar panel uh, Station near uh, Vulcan in Alberta. Yeah, it's an area they have about three hundred day days light days without clouds a year. Yeah, yeah solar the yeah. roadways. Yes. Yeah. So it's probably <laughs> economical even in Canada. I know in Hawaii it's economical, and as you said in Australia. Yeah. And uh, the trends are still that solar the price of solar panels are getting uh, lower, uh, continue to go down hit critical mass. There's a friend of mine with solar panels on his house here in Calgary. And his major complaint is he's generating electricity enough to put some back into the grid, yet he still gets a distribution uh, bill, a bill for distribution of electricity, uh -oh. even though it's going the other way. Yeah, minimum charge for sure. There's yeah. always minimum charge. They call it distribution charge. He still gets that. Even and that's a way that the cities of the future are going to have to sort of adapt, right? Because yeah. that's going to become more and more prevalent. And so they're going to have to, you know, like write new policies into existence, I guess, to address these sorts of things. Yeah. And, and think if every, if every roadway in Calgary what was a, a solar roadway, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't need the rooftop panels, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. We, have a, we have one minute left. Anyone has any last comment? In the chat, there's uh, a storage of solar energy in a column of molten salt somewhere in the U.S. And now I have only recently heard about um, molten salt as sort of like operating as a battery. That sounds super cool to me um, and definitely something very science fiction-y. And I, I wonder how feasible and sustainable that would be for a city or for like a federal government more like okay. Okay. We should uh, thank everyone for joining us. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a wonderful chat. Yes. Yeah.